Hi, everybody. I'm Dan Wells. I write horror, fantasy, and science fiction, and I talk about games on the internet. Today, I have the pleasure of talking about what might be the greatest horror game supplement I have ever come across, Berlin the Wicked City. This is for the Call of Cthulhu RPG, and uh, I need to say right up front that Berlin is my favorite city in the world. I have visited, I have studied it extensively, I have read it, uh, I've, I've written a book about it. Uh, if I had not been required to move back to the States again for uh, to be with family, I would be living there today. It's just a wonderful place. This book, though, does not talk about modern Berlin. This is talking about Weimar Republic Berlin. Now, the Weimar Republic for those of you who are not super up on your German history, that's the version of Germany that existed in between the two world wars. So from approximately 1918 until about 1933, more or less. Um, so there's a 15 year period in which Berlin was essentially a post-apocalyptic Las Vegas slash Babylon. Um, Berlin today, in 2020 is kind of, it, it is the center of Europe in a very real sense, the center of government, the center of culture, the center of politics, the center of art, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Berlin is what Paris used to be 200 years ago when Paris was the center of all of that stuff. Um, during the Weimar Republic, the First World War had just ended, um, like, like literally, you know, 1918, 1919 is when it ended and the seat of government was moved to the city of Weimar and Berlin was this enormous city and it got just a huge deluge, an influx of money, first of all, to rebuild it, uh, which is interesting because it was completely destroyed I mean, it wasn't wiped out the way a lot of the German cities were in World War II, but it absolutely had an apocalyptic feel to it. Um, it had a bunch of artists, people like behind me, you can see the art of Otto Dix, who was a very famous uh, German artist at the time. You've got uh, actors like Marlene Dietrich, uh, singers like Anita Berber, scientists, Albert Einstein lived in Weimar Berlin. Uh, so many important, famous people from all over. And so the city was just this kind of boiling pot of innovation, of culture, of decadence, and of freedom. All of the social norms that had existed in Germany, in Europe, for hundreds of years collapsed after the First World War. And so what you saw in a place like Berlin was on the one hand, horrific skyrocketing crime and prostitution and drug use and all of these other things. But on the other hand, entire classes of people who were free to be themselves for the first time ever. Uh, looking at my picture again, you can see there is, you know, at least one person who is either transsexual or transvestite. Uh, there's a lot of bisexuality, pansexuality, homosexuality, uh, a lot of these things that had never been publicly acceptable before. And now that civilization had collapsed, they were. And so there were good things and bad things all rolled up together into one just incredibly fascinating ball. And that's what this role-playing supplement is about. Take all of that... Um, you know, all of that money, take all of that crime, take all of that freedom, take all of that innovation, take all of that art, take all of the politics and the high tension and emotion that comes with it, and then add some supernatural elements, because this is a Cthulhu mythos book, and you've got an absolutely compelling setting to play games in. And this book digs into that setting more deeply than almost any role-playing supplement, any setting supplement I can ever remember reading. Um, 
the the best analog I can come up with is actually the Ubersreich book for Warhammer Fantasy. And that's not a real place. And this is several times longer. Took just a phenomenal amount of research to do it correctly. Um, and then, you know, turn it into a gameable setting. So anyway, let's take a quick look at what's in here. You've got uh, in the table of contents, chapter one, the city. This is talking about the history of Berlin. And it goes into a lot of really good detail on what is what is it like to live there? Who are the people that live there? Where do those people come from? A lot of them are, you know, native Germans. A lot of them came from all over the place. Weimar Berlin had a huge kind of uh, Jewish population that came in from Russia, tried to escape their revolutions. Um, it had people from all over. Like I said, it had become a center of politics and art and innovation. And so people from all over the place were there. And that's why one of the reasons money was pouring in and why they were able to have this incredibly decadent lifestyle, even in the middle of, you know, war recovery. Uh, chapter two is about the geography of Berlin. Uh, what are the buildings like? What kinds of places are there? And it goes through, it talks about the libraries and museum, talks about different places of interest. One of the places it talks about was the Haus Vaterland, which was, I want to call it one of the first food courts, and that's totally not even a fair description of it. It was a single building. In fact, I think there's a photo of it. Yeah, there we go. The Haus Vaterland. Uh, this was a... Uh, this was a single building that had five or six restaurants inside of it. Uh, and some of them were local German or European stuff. There was a Japanese tea house. There was stuff from all over. And they were all very heavily themed, kind of Epcot Center style, where they had, you know, one of these restaurants had a stream that had been piped in there and built so that there was trickling water and there were bushes and you were inside this building. So like I said, a lot of really fancy, high-class stuff. But then at the same time, uh, you had a lot of very low, cra low, crass, low class stuff, if I can manage to speak. Um, let's take a look here at uh, talking about crime, talking about gun laws. Um, 1920s Berlin was fascinating in a European gun law sense because almost every adult male in the city had served in or near the war. The war had just ended. And so not only were they serving in the war, they all came home with scars, with PTSD, and with guns. They had pistols, they had rifles, they had potato masher grenades, they had machine guns and submachine guns. Uh, and so there were some very strict gun laws that were eventually just canceled um, because nobody was following them and because the uh, citizenry were more heavily armed than the police and there wasn't really anything they can do about it. Um, there, were, there was also, and I'm trying to find it here, just an unbelievable sense of uh, an, un, a huge market for drugs, and here we have all of these drugs and their effects, there was a huge market for prostitution. Um, and so, ah, where's the, where's the prostitution thing? Uh, they have a whole little sidebar in here that is designed to show you, dang it, maybe it's in a different chapter. Um, Okay, so anyway, there's cool maps. There's all this neat stuff. Uh, let me find, let me find the prostitutes. Uh, there was a whole section in this uh, book here that talks about uh, the different kinds of prostitution and the different here it is, uh, the different nicknames that they had. So you know, what was a half silk? A half silk was a, a prostitute who had a real job during the day, real job as like a secretary or a shopkeeper or something, and then became a sex worker at night as supplementary income. And so there is, you know, two pages 
of all of these different uh, kinds of things. And, you know, you probably saw this as I was skipping through it. Like I said, there was an incredible LGBT movement in Weimar Republic. And so they, they talk about both sides of that coin, uh, good and bad, and, uh, you know, freedom meeting decadence and what that created and all of these other things. Chapter three is called, Oh, You Pretty Things. So chapter one talks about the history. Chapter two kind of talks about the geography. Chapter three talks about the people who lived there. And I already named some of them, but uh, let's kind of look at this. Bertolt Brecht was there. Um, Leah de Putti, Marlene Dietrich, Otto Dix, uh, Friedrich Ebert, Albert Einstein, Ruth Fisher. And then we get to Joseph Goebbels, which is a really good time to point out that this is a very mature book. This is a mature game set in a mature city dealing with very mature themes. One of the darkest and most horrific parts of the Weimar Republic is that it saw the rise of the Nazi movement. And so a lot of the locations and people and adventures that are included in this book have that as this very kind of nasty undercurrent in the background, especially the third adventure, which takes place in the early 1930s, where the Nazi movement was really starting to rise up. And so the game as a whole does not look away from any of this. It does not pull its punches. You have got um, all of the sex, all of the drugs, all of the fairly horrific violence. One of the, uh, one of the famous real-life characters that shows up in this game is Carl Grossman, who was an actual serial killer who lived in Weimar, Berlin, uh, and uh, ate people. And so you get stuff like that showing up. And then, of course, friggin' Joseph Goebbels and the brown shirts and the Nazis. And so you get to see a lot of this stuff happen. It is not a game I would recommend for children. And honestly, not a game or a game supplement that I would recommend for people who are sensitive, uh, for people who don't want to deal with these themes. Uh, sometimes uh, in a horror game, you can just cut out the really dark stuff that you don't want to deal with. I don't know if that's possible <laughs> with Berlin, the Wicked City. Uh, we'll get into the three adventures in a minute and talk about what those are about. But um, these dark themes are just part and parcel of them. And uh, I don't think that it would be possible to do a uh, clean or PG rated version of any of these scenarios because they really dive into this stuff and force the characters to confront it and deal with it. So anyway, very mature book. Let's look at those right now because uh, we have talked about those. Well, let's look at chapter four really quick. Uh, this is Mythos Berlin. All, chapters one through three are especially awesome because they are historically accurate, right? they go into copious detail. And the amount of real world research that went into this book is astonishing. What chapter four does is it takes all that stuff and it starts to say, well, what are you gonna do with this? How are we gonna supernatural this a little bit? And so you get you know, things talking about cults, things talking about scenario ideas. How are you gonna take all of this real historical information and turn it into a Cthulhu horror game. And there's just so many different ideas here. And uh, it's really great. Now, the next three chapters, I'm not even going to click onto them because I do not want to give anything away. I don't want to risk providing spoilers. Okay? So we are going to start here, and I'm just going to give you a very quick spoiler free version uh, overview of each of these three scenarios. These are designed as a trilogy. You can play them as standalones or you can play the three of them in order and then they become a mini campaign that kind of tracks the history of the Weimar Republic from the darkest side possible. Uh, chapter five, The Devil Eats Flies. This is, I'm just gonna say it, 
I thought long and hard about whether I should say this or not, and I do tend toward hyperbole on this channel, but The Devil Eats Flies is the best horror RPG scenario that I have ever seen. Hands down. Uh, I can't think of a single one that I like more. And it begins with Anastasia Romanov. Uh, the Weimar Republic does line up very neatly with the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia and the fall of the Romanov family. And of course, Anastasia Romanov is one of the most famous missing people of all of history. And this adventure begins with the suggestion that she might be alive in Berlin. And so the characters are asked to help, you know, figure out if it's really her, to help protect her, to help, you know, deal with this influx of several Russian uh, officials, uh, kind of proto-Soviets who are coming in, trying to uh, determine if this is really her, someone to help her, someone to protect her. While that fascinating political story is going on, the characters, one or two of the characters, and several of the other people throughout the city are starting to have incredibly disturbing nightmares about murder and cannibalism. And they will see, you know, these murdered or chopped up bodies in their dreams. They will see some in the real world. Sometimes they'll see it in a dream first and then see it, the same body, in the real world. And this starts to add up and this starts to stack up those, you know, sanity damage points. And uh, how does this all relate and where does it all go? It is, it is a dark, dark scenario, and it is a very complicated scenario. But, as is true with all three in this book, your effort as a game master is rewarded. It is going to take a lot of reading and a lot of study to make sure you can run these scenarios correctly. But if you do, they are going to be just phenomenal horror stories for your characters. So... Hooray for the Devil Eats Flies. It's really cool. That takes place in the early 20s. Several years later, um, Dances of Vice, Horror, and Ecstasy is kind of two different time periods. There's 1926 and there's 1928. This one deals with Anita Berber, who I mentioned is one of the other real historical figures that shows up in this book. Anita Berber was a singer, an actress, a stripper, you know, at different periods and in, and in different lights, she was called many different things. Um, and this scenario begins with the characters going to watch a performance of hers, and then something very strange happens, and then leads into a story that deals with cults of wizards, uh, with uh, cults of, uh, that might be sex cults, uh, with lots of different dark things happening. Um, it's... It's, it doesn't have the kind of in-your-face bloody murder cannibalism that the first one has, but it is every bit as disturbing in its own way um, because of the things that people are doing and the lengths that people will go to to get what they want and the ramifications. Where this adventure can eventually lead is truly kind of stunning. Uh, I'm not going to say any more. Dances of Vice, Horror, and Ecstasy is fantastic. The last one, Shrek film, begins with what might be the most compelling adventure hook that I've ever run across in my many long years of gaming. Uh, the characters are outside in a crowd, and a woman comes barreling through, running from someone. She is underdressed for the cold. She is terrified. She is clearly trying to get away from somebody, bumps into the characters, and then runs off into the night. And they're not able to find her or where she's gone, but they do see she dropped on the ground a folder that contains, among other things, a picture of the characters talking to people they've never met before. And that's where the whole adventure spins out from. Who was she? Why does she have a picture of us? And who are we talking to? How can this picture even exist? All of these questions. It deals with a movie crew. It deals with a, uh, you know, more 
dark supernatural things. All three of these, like I said, are complicated, mature adventures. They are not for the light of the, the faint of heart. You are going to want a game master who is ready to do their homework and really study these before running them. And then also a play group that is willing to dive into this kind of brightly lit decadent cesspool of a city in order to really get the most out of these adventures. If you have all of that, this is just absolute magic. Uh, some of the best horror gaming that you will ever have in one of the most compelling settings that you will ever play in. So, hooray for Berlin the Wicked City. Um, I, uh, at the, I, I need to stop talking about it now at the risk of just gushing for the next half an hour, and uh, then everyone's going to say, well, shut up about it now, I don't even want to play it. Yes, you do. Uh, you, would, you definitely want to check this out. Uh, the uh, book won a bunch of industry awards uh, for being an incredible gaming supplement, and it has absolutely lived up to that reputation. This is one of the finest supplements that I have ever read or reviewed. I don't do a top 10 list, like these are the 10 best things I reviewed this year or whatever. If I were to do that, this book would 100% be on that list um, because it is quite simply the best horror supplement, the best horror adventure that, I, that I've that i ever read. Uh, so just really great stuff. Anyway, um, before I close, I do want to uh, say again, uh, I love Berlin and I have written a book about Berlin. It is not a horror, it is an espionage novel, but if you are interested in reading what Dan Wells wrote set in the city of Berlin, uh, my book Ghost Station is available on Audible. It is an audio exclusive, so there is not yet a print version of it. And it is um, it's set in just after World War II instead of after World War I. Uh, so instead of Weimar Republic, it is a Cold War spy story about double agents in the early days of the Berlin Wall. So check that out. As long as we're promoting things, I've got a Twitch channel, Typecast RPG, where I'm the game master for what is right now a D&D &D campaign called The Gods of Aaron. And also, I'm a professional game master. So if you want someone to run a game for you, a one-shot or a campaign, I will do it. And the information, the link to follow, is in the liner notes to this video. So, thanks for watching. I'm Dan Wells, and you are awesome.